Hi, this, I'm Ashby Walters. I'm the executive director for Tax Board and Future Tax Leaders, the subsidiary of Tax Board. Our presentation today, our webinar is on uh, business prosperity during a pandemic. And I'd like to thank our panelists for joining us on this call. This uh, webinar is part of a series of webinars that Tax Board is offering on how to navigate through an environment such as the one that we're experiencing right now. This webinar was sold out, but we do have a few seats available still for tomorrow. Uh, each webinar is going to be on different subjects, so we recommend everybody to take a look, see what tomorrow's is about, and then we're all in the process right now of scheduling two for next week. Some of the subjects are, that we're going to cover next week are going to be on individual financing as well as on uh, tax matters. So I'd like to start by introducing our panelists. I'm going to begin with Bill Decker. Bill Decker is the founder and managing director of Partners International. He has 30 plus years of experience in marketing and advising businesses on entering the U.S. and foreign markets. So he's also the founder, I'm sorry, the founder of a 3D printing professional association called the Association of 3D Printing. So Bill Decker, thank you for joining us. And then Jen McCabe, she's a partner of Armenino LLP. She, her focus is on business outsourcing and restructuring services. She has 30 plus years of experience in accounting, treasury, and finance functions. Jen, thank you for joining us. Hi. And then Lou Vischer is also uh, joining us on this call. He's the founder of Lose List, a community of over a thousand, I'm sorry, 11,000 individuals that provides information on jobs, networks, industry and field developments, and CP. And he's also been a CFO for a handful of tech companies for over 25 years. Lou, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And then Lori Martin is also scheduled to join us today. She's not on the phone just yet. Uh, she's here. I'm here. I'm here. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> Sorry. No worries. Nice to see you, Lori. Nice Thank you. So uh, Lori is the Director of People at Cohere Health. She has 20 plus years of experience in HR, including VP of People at Yaymaker and Director of Human Resources at TripAdvisor. So Lori, thanks for joining us. Sure, thanks for having me. So let's, uh, and we'd like to invite everybody to ask questions um, during this presentation. We'd love to hear how, um, the, how people are being affected by this experience and um, you know, if they have any questions it, that we can answer to in terms of um, what they're experiencing or what their businesses are experiencing that are related to that are speaking today please do reach out to us. All right, so let's begin with Lou. Uh, Lou, what are you seeing and hearing out there from CFOs? Um, well, I'll probably start with a couple quotes uh, that I got directly, which was, um, you know, our company's doing B2B sales and, and we're down 75% from last week. Um, nobody's buying anything. The media is only concerned with restaurants. <laughs> um, that was one. Um, I'm also talking to a few C CEOs and, you know, uh, somebody that sells um, and procures things out of Ch China. Um, thankfully, uh, he said, you know, because of the tariffs, they've started to move, that Trump put in place, they started to move some of those um, procurement items out to different countries and, and different places. But, you know, obviously, because of this is causing problems getting goods out of foreign countries. Um, and so it slowed that. But also on the sales side, they're, they're just seeing tremendous, um, you know, everything's getting canceled. Um, as we all know, it's canceling. Everything's canceling everywhere. So major trade shows, major customer meetings. Um, so they're trying to focus on where they still have high volume. But um, it's going to get tough. Uh, very uh, soon it, and they're going to start to see the impact if they haven't already. Um, other CFOs I'd say are, you know, scared, nervous. I think they're, you know, the big word seems to be uncertainty. Like what really, really is the impact of all this to our business? Um, how long is it going to last? 
Um, and then I guess from a personal perspective, you know, that their personal perspective or from a financial perspective, the, the one I've heard recently, and, and, and it's kind of funny in some ways, but not really, is that everybody's 401k is now becoming a 201k um, <laughs> per, pretty quickly. So, you know, and, and the other, I guess, phrase that I've heard a lot probably out in the market is, you know, this, this one's probably not like a lot of others in that it's not just a pause and then we push play. Um, I think the play buttons got moved and it's going to be different. Um, and we're just unfortunately not sure how long this pause is going to take. So um, I'll talk a little bit more later, maybe on some of the hiring and stuff, but I, I'm from lose list perspective where CFOs are reaching out to me and they're just putting everything on hold. Um, you know, any of their hires are on hold. So I, I see that. You, If you're a member of Lose List, you'll see postings going down dramatically. I, I think people are just going to go on hold for a while. Jen, what a, your organization, as well as Bill, uh, what you do as well, yeah. your helps uh, companies in situations like this. What are some of the things that Armino is doing and uh, what are you advising your clients? So um, I, I'm, I'm like Lou, a lot of our clients are CFOs who call Armanino for help. And because our outsourcing team does both accounting and HR, they're calling about staffing changes uh -huh. and wanting to know what the government programs are going to do to help them help their staff. Um, I am the CFO for several of our biggest clients. And so when Lou's talking, I will tell you, I, I will say to you, Lee, that, Lou, that what I hear is a lot of talk about cash, number one. So we are helping people project their cash runway and how long cash will last because it's drying up. As Lou said, there's a problem with their supply chain uh, if it's Chinese or anywhere in the world. Um, and there's a problem with the sales pipeline, which is nobody wants to buy anything. So things are at an absolute stop. The conversations I have are, I don't have anything going on at all, period. I've never been like this. And so for my clients where I'm the CFO or I'm talking to a CFO, cash comes first. The next uh, discussion we have is around communication. Because um, of course, everybody wants to tell their clients and their people what's going on. So we at Armanino, we have a crisis communication team and they actually help clients with crisis communication. Sometimes that's better for me to hand off. Um, when it comes to staff, we, we do a lot of it. And then the last thing is control. So most of the clients want us to help them with control, meaning stop the spending, re review the budget, the forecast, or help them with their current policies and procedures as far as staff or handbooks or expense report policies or purchasing policies. So it falls under those things, those three things, cash control, communication advice, and really uh, how are they going to control what's going forward. And Lou said the uncertainty is how long is this going to last? And, and we, they're asking us for that too, and we can't do that, of course. Mm -hmm. Okay. Bill, what, uh, what are your thoughts in this regard? So what are you advising? Uh, your clients? Uh, well, I, I think the magic word that Lou touched on and, and, and Jen did as well is control. That's the most expensive seven letters in business. And almost every business problem is about that. Sales not hitting numbers, employees not listening to you, clients not doing what you want them to. It's all about kids not doing their homework. It's always about control. So what I see is because everyone is so confused and there are so many mixed messages not just from government, but from our peers and from other businesses, is this feeling that you're not in control. And if you can't communicate control to a client, you could pretty much count on losing the client. You have to let them know you've got plans. You know, Lou said something very interesting, uh, and he spoke about shipments coming from China. And I've been in international business for 30 years, and I have told everybody this. Do not use a sole source country. Just don't. And we got such a slap in the face when we had the tsunami in Fukushima. 
And that should have taught every American company not to sole source. Here's this giant wave that wipes out a piece of Japan and no one can get products that come from that region only. I, I don't know how many more times we have to say this to a customer and to a company. Uh, you need more than one place to get stuff. It's that simple. I, I live in Denver, Colorado, and there's more than one supermarket. Isn't that interesting? So if one catches on fire, I can go to another one. So what can businesses the, do now? I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. But what can businesses do now? Well, the answer is proactivity. You know, you can tell a client almost anything if you tell them in advance. And that, that's even when times are good. I mean, accountants miss deadlines all the time. If a client has to call and say, where's my tax return? You've already got a, a minus one situation. If a client, if an accountant says, listen, the tax return's gonna be late, I filed an extension, it'll be here in four days, you can preserve that relationship because people wanna feel that they're informed. Uh, I probably am a member of, I don't know, 50, 60, 70 restaurants and they have my email and they have my cell phone and I get tables that way. And only one has written to me saying, we still have food and it's for pickup and delivery. And this is how you do it. Push this button and you can order. So don't worry, you're not gonna starve. Here's a picture of our kitchen staff. You can see they're masked and gloved. So we've got clean going. And then you sit there and say, okay, these guys have done some contingency planning. These guys are in control. Or doing uh, same time innovation. So, well, well I'm a marketing guy. And I, and I always like to say, who's better at marketing than me? Let's, let's pick someone. How about Coca-Cola? They probably know how to market. So what do they do? Well, you can buy Coke in a restaurant. You can buy it in a grocery store. You can buy it at a wholesaler. You can buy it online. You can buy it in a bar. You can buy it in a restaurant. You can buy it in a can on the street. So they have massive different kinds of distribution, which helps the client wherever he or she is to buy their product. And that's the same thing businesses should be doing now. They should be saying, okay, we, we have been distributing a certain way. That distribution channel is not in the shape we want it to be. Uh, we really need to make sure we have other distribution channels. So do you see opportunities for businesses to retool their current distribution channel, perhaps uh, either modify it or move to a different form of distribution? You use delivery as an example but perhaps even leverage the current distribution channel to help other businesses. So for example, um, Staples or one of the um, like soda vendors uh, leverage their distribution channel to help get medicines out to people or to help get um, you know, other foodstuffs, for example, to yeah. people. It, well, it's a tricky play too because these businesses, let's say Amazon's running trucks, uh, they still need to be paid. So when does it become profiteering uh, on this crisis and when does it become sound business? And you know, you see it all over the newspaper that insulin costs so much money. Well, it's gonna cost even more if Amazon has to get involved in getting it to you uh, because they may have a clean truck, they may have a, a hermetically sealed truck, they may have a disinfected truck. So there's that moral problem that you run into. There is another business I was in for many years, about nine years, and that's 3D printing. And 3D printing solves so many product problems right now. If you can't get a part from China, but you can print it locally, and I've been pushing this like a, like a preacher running around telling people they need to be in 3D printing, and we started the biggest association. It's the same kind of dynamic, though. You need to know about this new technology and have it available. The time to start 3D printing is not now. The time to start 3D printing was yesterday. So I want to take a step back. Uh, you, Jen, you brought up a good point in terms of control, and then Bill, you followed up on that, providing people a sense of control. What? Uh, so this question goes out to all of you. What are the businesses that are going to be successful now? in this environment. Uh, Bill, you brought up uh, innovation or mentioned innovation. What are some other, uh, for example, Lori, what are you seeing on the HR side of things where companies are best positioned to be successful in this situation? 
Lori, you have to unmute yourself. Uh, I'm trying. Sorry, I was trying to find the button. Where is it? <laughs> Thanks. Um, so I think my company currently is in a unique situation because we are a healthcare technology startup and we're small and we are you know venture backed funded and still have our money and we we can all work virtually and and so we are and we're all working at from home and and it's been business as usual for my company people want to we've been doing things to keep people close together and to keep track of people um, for example um, one of our employees put together virtual breakfast and virtual lunch so that we meet from eight to nine if you want to it's totally optional and eat your breakfast with some other people who are on the google hangout with us or eat your lunch with people on this so that we can stay connected and not feel so isolated if we're trapped so to speak in our homes and it's been great because we've been able to see people's kids and stuff who are running around the house because they're home from school and it's been actually kind of fun but um but i'm worried that we just may be a little bit behind the curve and what could happen if this continues for another month or two months or three months and then uh, from my from a family perspective i've heard from my my niece who's been furloughed for two weeks starting tomorrow with and has told to go collect unemployment and and then um, my husband who um, um, also has been told to he's been furloughed for two weeks and they're paying out his pto to him to keep him whole and to keep him covered on his benefits but what happens two weeks from now to the to both those people and to lots of other people so I feel like we need to do something now to sort of help people. And I know the federal government's trying to do something, but I don't know if they're going fast enough. But then there's also the, what if we get sick? I mean, <laughs> there's, still, there's that too. So all those things are weighing on people's mind and we're trying to stay busy and productive, but it, it, can, it is a distraction. What are some opportunities that you're seeing or do you feel are presented by this current situation? So this, I keep trying to say, what's the silver lining to all of this? And for for from my for my company, the, and for because we're a tech company, um, it's we're really working learning how to work virtually, so we can work from anywhere. So when we get back together, when this is over, when and if it's over, do we need to have office space? Can we continue to do it this way? You know, are, are there ways? And then and then that opens up a whole. Um, world of candidates we don't have to limit ourselves to just the local area we can hire people from anywhere if we can make the virtual working really work well so I'm just trying to see the silver lining in in that way um, there's also other ways and not necessarily from business related but I feel like people will have better hygiene habits <laughs> after this and um, and I think people will think more about you know if they're spending more time with their kids what you know how valuable is that to them if they're spending more time with other family members that they it's kind of a gift and if they can look at it as a gift and what can they get out of it I think all those things are silver linings to the issue mm. um, Lou how about you do you, are there potential opportunities that you see presented by this current situation well, I think if you have cash um, <clears throat> you maybe have a strong balance sheet might be a great opportunity for you to uh, acquire um, a companies that <clears throat> probably don't have all that that are good businesses to acquire you might be um, poised to take market share if you have that kind of strong balance sheet and cash um, you know and I think maybe a little bit to what can companies do. I think the, the smart ones, if they can anticipate what this recovery is going to look like, uh, nobody knows when it's going to start. It will start. It will come back. If they can anticipate through that and how they can play an important part in that and capitalize on that recovery strategically, I think those are the ones that will be successful. Um, again, not everybody's going to be able to do that because of other circumstances and how long this lasts. Some people won't last through this downturn. Um, but that's some of the opportunities I see. I'm guessing, and I haven't really thought through a lot of this, but I'm guessing there are 
various products and technologies or services out there that can you know, implement something, change something to address what's going on in the market and, and to capitalize on some of these opportunities. I mean, I even look at, I, I was kind of selfishly thinking of lose list on what, you know, what can I do? I'm definitely going to see a downturn in, in job postings and everything. But when this starts to recovery, if I had to guess, I think the staffing and contract employment um, side of the business is going to flourish rather than the perm, at least to start in the first six to 12 months. People are going to be really hesitant to hire, but I think they have to get things done. They're going to have to have people in place. And so from a contract, and I think you're going to see a ton of that going on. That It's a personal view. Um, I could be wrong, but that, that could be an opportunity for, for some as well. But I'm sure there's tons out there. Okay. So uh, both, it sounds like from what you're saying, along with what Bill and Jen, Bill's been, had mentioned as well, is innovation's one of them. So um, there might be some opportunities to innovate and involve, but then also to partner with other companies and potentially evolve through uh, the legal entity process as well through transactions. So how about yeah. you, Jen? I, I, you know, as you're talking, I'm thinking about my clients, but I'm also thinking about Armanina. We have got 1,400 people right now working from home. And uh, a little about what, what Lori said, we have stand-up meetings by group in the morning, and it's kind of fun for me to see everybody's face in the morning. And yes, you know, my husband's wandering behind me shirtless to get coffee, and someone else's kid is throwing their arms around their dad. And um, so that's actually, in a way, getting us more connected. So I, I like the human side of it. On the technology side, about what Lou was saying, we're experimenting with other technologies. So I think as a company, we have a new, one of the groups is experimenting with a new whiteboard. Our strategy and transformation team are being called on a lot. They go into companies and help evolve into a work from home option. And so they have to get together with their clients and they usually whiteboard solutions. And so now they have this new whiteboard app that nobody's heard of and they're trying it. And we're gonna come out the other side in that group smarter and better and maybe paying for less airfare. Maybe they'll find ways to not have to fly around the world all the time to do their job. Um, so just at Armanino, I'm seeing innovation happen and some new connectivity. With our clients, I have I have tech funded clients who um, might you know they're they're young wild crazy people. They remind me a lot of the the dot com crash actually. Lou and I both have more than thirty years of experience, and you know we've been here not just once in 08, but even before. And what came out of that was there was a lot of companies that were VC funded or venture funded, and they they had three or four ideas and young leaders who are wildly creative. And what happened was they had to focus their energies and cash went to where there was somebody really coming up with something very important and, and people stopped being frivolous with their investments. The other thing in, in Lou's world is people came out of that really grateful for their jobs. Anybody who's on this call who's a business owner knows how hard talent has been to get and keep for the last decade. People are coming out of school and staying at their job for one or two years. So people will pivot. They will become smarter about what they really want to do, first of all, after this time to think. And I think that employers, at least, are going to see, hey, there's talent. I, I can hire somebody. Hmm. Okay. Uh, Bill, you and I had talked about some of the changes that had occurred as a result of the um, writer strike in Hollywood several years ago uh, and what companies can do to keep their clients. Um, and you mentioned that this is actually a great time, a great opportunity for companies to differentiate themselves. What are some things that companies can do to um, to keep their clients and to um, perhaps even grow their client base during this time period? Well, there's a lot of things you can do to keep them. Uh, Archie Bunker, 
who was on All in the Family years ago, before some of you were even born out there, was in a diner getting terrible service. And he said to his wife, I haven't seen a good waitress since the depression. And I live in Denver and Denver has skyrocketed in growth. It's become a foodie town. And I gotta tell you, the service has been awful. I uppity restaurant owners, bad wait staff. I mean, I just, I'm surrounded with it here. So I used to own a restaurant and I used to say to my staff, what do we sell? And they'd say, I don't know, we sell food. I'm like, no, we sell a good time. So differentiating on service to me is the win now. Um, somehow in my lifetime, tips became 20% and not 15%. What? And, and a, even on a wine. So you buy a $100 bottle of wine, now it's 120 bucks. And all you've done is open it and pour it, same as you would in a $1 bottle of wine, if there's such a thing. So this idea of differentiating on service to me is going to be one of the key factors. The other thing is to dovetail on what Lou said, uh, I can get a CFO for half price now. I mean, people are very doom and gloom oriented right now. I see nothing but opportunity. Sure, it's going to hurt in the short term. But when I can buy Royal Caribbean Cruise Lines for 20 bucks a share when it was 110, when I can buy Disney at 75 when it was 140, and when I can invest in my clients' companies at their own share prices, whether it's closely hold or public, that's an enormous opportunity. What a way for a company like Amarino to get sticky with one of its large clients and say, hey, we're making a, a sizable investment into your company. Uh, if you have control, if you have some free cash flow, and cash is king, there's no question, you can't do a lot of these things without. But if you have those kinds of things, you're gonna see more and more and more opportunity because this one has to fundamentally change us. I thought the swine flu would change us H1N1 in 2009. Just to give you guys a little perspective, H1N1, 2008, 2009, 2010, 61 million Americans were infected. 61 million. As of yesterday, 8,000 had coronavirus. So yeah, maybe it'll go to 100,000 or 200,000, but it's not 61 million. So once again, people are overreacting, the markets are overreacting, companies are overreacting by laying people off or slowing them down or putting them on part time. And I can't predict when this turns around, but when it does, I'll have had cheaper media, cheaper internet, right? Cheaper SaaS programming. I can negotiate with every supplier. I can bring on top talent and I can do this all now while the market is crashing and while the market is down and while everyone's afraid. The, the line I use is when there's blood on the street, it's time to buy land. That's yeah. actually not my line. Yeah. So, so essentially your point is, is take advantage of this opportunity to the extent that you, that you can find a way to take advantage. So it might not be limited to cash flow. It's about partnerships, about innovation. Um, if you do have the cash, take the cash, but you know, or leverage the cash, but find some way to use this experience, this opportunity to differentiate yourself as that one restaurant did to yeah. Um, yeah. have more market share. Absolutely. Um, and I did want to point out, so part of the reason some people might be wondering why I'm not, why we're not spending a lot of time on cash flow today just because a big part of the conversation tomorrow is actually going to be about cash flow. Um, so what we're uh, focusing on through this webinar is more on strategy, what people can do outside of cash flow to uh, help uh, set their, their path towards success um, during this experience. Um, Lou, is there a, what are, your, what are your thoughts in regards to this? Is there something from an operational or strategic aspect that you would recommend people take into consideration? Um, I think one of the big things they have to do currently is scenario planning. I think you should run every scenario you possibly can from doomsday to, you know, that this recovers pretty quickly. I think that's a pretty strategic thing to do right now. Um, as I mentioned before, I think then is to anticipate when that recovery is and how you can capitalize from it as kind of your strategic something else. And there's all kinds of tactical things to be doing, you know, getting all these tools. I, I know there's been some discussion about what are all these tools for working remotely and some of those. And, and while they're not that strategic, I think working from home and remote is going to be a 
uh, thing that's going to happen pretty extensively here. And so um, I, I could always, I've heard, I've heard a lot of, of these tools. Some, if you've got high volume of activity, you know, there's things like Slack, which seems to be a big one. I won't go into the details of these, but obviously Gmail. Zoom is, is I think, kicking butt. There's Zoom's really helping out a lot of companies uh, for video conferencing. There's Asana, which uh, is a task orientated thing. There's a Time Doctor, which is an online remote thing. There's uh, Vervo, which is a hiring on automation tool, scores and video things through autom hiring thing. And there's another one called Zoho. These are some examples, I think, of tools that remote people are, uh, or remote <coughs> offices are using. And that, to somebody that's never had a remote workforce, these are all new. And so now they've got to learn all these things and figure out how to procure them and, and all those things. But, um, and then um, I think maybe another thing strategically, which this is going to seem a little bit more tac uh, tactics than strategic, is, and it's kind of tied to cash flow, is everybody's got contracts for a lot of different things. And there's, um, there's some tips maybe are these, what they call force majeure. You, you've always read all these contracts. Everybody's got those in there. And I think everybody glosses over them. Well, guess what? I'm guessing there's some of these contracts that got stuff in there that says, hey, if there's a disaster, if the government shuts you down, you may not have to pay your rent. Uh, or you may get out of the, some contract. I would encourage people to go look at these contracts, particularly for huge obligations they have, where they end up paying for something in this tough time, and um, they may not have to. Um, business interruption insurance, an opportunity. I, you know, I think when SARS and a whole bunch of this other stuff came out, a lot of these insurance companies tried to kind of eliminate that because they got killed. But um, I would encourage people to look at those as well. And then my last kind of strategic tip is, uh, man, talk to your advisors, talk to your tax accounts, talk to your, um, you know, your auditors, your accountants, your benefit providers, your insurance, your lawyers. They're going to have all kinds of ideas for you to try to help you because that's their job to migrate through this stuff. And uh, you, might, you, you never know what kind of tips you find from these people that can help you do some things to save you some money or, or help your business. So to leverage your network. Yep. Yeah. And I love your recommendation in regards to reviewing your contracts and not forget that it's for events like this that we have insurance. So and take a look at the insurance policies that you have to see if there are some that cover this situation. Some of them will cover if the government shuts you down. I, Lou, you're right. They generally don't cover a pandemic, but if the government actually shuts you down, that can be covered by business interruption. And the recommendation I have there is file a claim. And um, we heard this today from one of our insurance brokers. File the claim because if the government changes the rules on that to help you out, you have to have a claim lined up. So get after that. Lori, what are some HR considerations? Hey, Lori, you got the rest of the time on this, so no, I'm just kidding. I know. <laughs> this is going to be the big one. So from an HR consideration as far as what, what can we do now to, you know, how can we take advantage of this? Well, I think we're consider we're keeping going from, a, from my company, we're, we're, we're full steam ahead. We're continuing to hire. We're continuing to build the product that we said we would build. Um, and we're continuing to do our work and we're not stopping. And we, we're continuing to file our roadmap because our roadmap takes us through 2020 and we launch in 2021. So our, our, our year before us is pretty good unless we get hit with something that I can't imagine right now. But if I was working at Yaymaker or at TripAdvisor, um, that's more difficult there because their business has gone down. Yaymaker, um, I don't know if you know, it's formerly known as Paint Night and they do, if you've ever seen people teaching in a bar, everyone the same painting a group of people eating and drinking so it's very much a come together and have an experience and connect with other people in person which is social distancing is the direct opposite of and so it's really impacted their business but they're trying to be innovative 
um, and they came up with one that's on video, and it's not video, it's live. So you're, they have the artists painting, and everybody gets their drink from wherever they're logging in from, and everyone paints the painting together. And so they're, they're, they're and they hadn't thought of that before, and they just came out with that. And so they're trying to innovate in that way and say, how can we turn this on this head and still have a connection with people and still have fun and still learn how to paint this painting and, 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 and create a memory that's, that's, um, that's fun. So, so it's thinking that way that they're, that they're trying to, to, to like turn something on their head and say, how can we turn this around and make it work for us? And I think that's what every company's got, got to do is they've got to think about how, what can I do differently and still, you know, fulfill the mission of why, why we exist as a company. Mm. How would you recommend, what would you recommend to businesses that they do in order to not maintain, or not, I'm sorry, lose clients, but to lose employees, but to maintain their employees and how to manage employees through this experience? Because if employees are still employed, they must have a lot of fear and concerns as to what's going to um, you know, happen to them in a few weeks from now if, if things are continuing as they are. Yeah, I mean, all you can, I think all you can do is be tra as transparent as you possibly can and be honest with people and don't mislead people. You don't want to also be a, you know, scare people unnecessarily, but I think you need to be very forthright and you need to communicate on a daily basis with people so they don't feel disconnected and out of the loop, whether it's face to face through video or whether it's a, an email out to everyone or whatever works for your company, but making sure everyone is always in the loop about what's going on. Because the minute you feel disconnected, you start, you start to feel like you start to fear the worst. So I, I just, th I think reaching out to people and I've been trying to make sure I, I touch points with every person and then encourage their manager. But there's too many people. Like I, I can do it in my small company, but when you have a bigger company, encouraging the managers to make sure they're reaching out to every single one of their team members and not to let, you know, 48 hours go by without talking to them and making, checking in with them and seeing what they're, you know, what, and not to check in and see how they're working, but just to see how they're doing on a very personal level. Think that. That's helpful. I have a really good example of the, the building that we are in is in downtown Boston and it's a, it's a shared workplace and they have been so great about communicating. They communicate every day and they don't, they tell us, okay, this person showed up in, uh, in early March and now they've been diagnosed with uh, coronavirus this is what we've done. This is the, you know, and this is what we recommend. And they've been really, I've really been really impressed with the management of that building. And so it makes me say, I don't want to give up our space there because they're really, even though I don't need it right now, I mean, maybe I won't need it. Maybe we'll stay remote. But right now I have a very positive view of that company and how they run their, their facility. Jen and, um, and Lori, how would you differentiate um, furloughs from layoffs. I'm working on furloughs like crazy right now. Um, and in, in a large company, a furlough is more complicated because you have to put up notices. They're called warns. And in a small company, in some states it's less than 50, in California it's 75 or less. You don't have to really do a bunch of notices. But what I like about a furlough is, and I'm I, I run an HR team and I'm a CFO. So as an accountant, uh, a layoff is a permanent solution. They're gone. You're done. You pay out the PTO if there's any and you're, you move forward. But the other side of this is you have to ask your clients, and we've all talked about this, is this going to be a long or a short-term problem for you? If you have a, an essential product, or if you have a way to make your product essential, it's a short-term problem and you're gonna need to turn around and you're gonna need your workforce available. So if you're a small and nimble company like Lori's is, a furlough would be a much better solution than a total layoff because you can send people home. Do I, I always say pay out the PTO or accrued vacation, but then send them home and they can collect unemployment and you can opt to keep them on the medical benefits, which I think sends a message to the staff 
because we're all trying not to be fear mongers, that this will end. And there is going to be a day when I send you a note that says it's time to come back to work. Um, furloughs can be a little dicey. You know, ones in Vegas where they lay off the hotel workers. You have to be very communicative with your workers so they know what to expect. Um, but that's why a furlough can be preferable. And I noticed yesterday that the government is releasing an update to warn. I don't know if you saw it, Lori, but it looks like they're easing the rules about it because clearly it would be great for a lot of companies in this situation to be able to simply furlough workers. And the message to the marketplace at large is that this is a short term thing and that we're all going to come back. And, you know, we're all about confidence in our market right now. And that I think it's a better message. Thank you. Um, Lori, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I think furloughs are, are if you can do it, as great. And being able to continue to um, pay for people's benefits and keep them on the benefit plan, because people worry about that. That's the first thing. When you lose your job, you lose your benefits. And then, and then it's like, now what do I do? And so that helps people to not have to worry about that and be able to focus on um, other things that they can do and not have to worry about that. Um, layoffs are tough because, but I can, but I can understand why they have to do that. If you cannot foresee needing like the hotels, needing someone to clean the rooms because no one's sleeping in the rooms, then what, are, what are you going to do? And if you can't afford to keep, um, a hundred people on benefits who aren't working, that's hard to do too. So, but I would, if you can do furlough, furloughs, I would, I would advocate for those. Okay. All right. Um, I'd like to address another item as well, uh, which is the financial reporting and accounting aspect of this. Uh, Jen, is there a, what are some considerations from a financial reporting and accounting? Well, um, well I'm a, I always want it to be great, of course, <laughs> but I think that because of the new legislation that's coming at every day, literally every four hours, there's a new rule um, and maybe a new benefit. So now more than ever, I think you need to use your technology, stay up to date, because if you're going to get a tax credit next year, and there's a lot of talk about if you spend money to take care of staff today and you're required to, to maybe give them paid sick leave, the government is saying you have to protect their jobs. You have to give them a certain amount of sick pay. And meanwhile, the company is strapped for cash. And so they, it looks like they have to wait till next year to get a credit on their taxes. In order to get the credit, you have to track that dimension of your spending. So I think it's very important for companies listening, if you pay for someone who's sick, um, if you have expenses because of COVID that you can particularly track this, this event, that will be really important for you to report the exact amount. And again, like the insurance claim question as well. So in terms of financial reporting to get a tax credit, you have to track it. And now I'm gonna go back to the HR piece. If you have to pay people who are out because they are sick with COVID, there are particular benefits, which means you need a timesheet. And you know everybody hates that. I hate timesheets more than anyone you know because I'm always the timesheet cop. But it means that we probably need to track people's time out sick versus sick with COVID or taking care of a family member who's got COVID because I think that it could be very important. The government may say, we don't care, we'll take your word for it. And they're probably gonna have to. But I would be tracking expenses on this for the tax credit down the road. Um, I think it's possible that when you issue your financial statements to investors, you're going to need to tie whatever sales you lost, if you can, as specifically as possible to this period of time and tell them why they're, you're gonna be fine for going forward. So in all of your financial statements, you're gonna to wanna to have this ability to say, yes, that happened, but here's why I'm so strong. Okay. Hey, um, Ashley, the, uh, Ashley, this is Lou. One of, one of the things I've been hearing recently is, you know, a lot of the public company audits are just wrapping up. Um, 
for the calendar years. And now you're starting to get into all the small and mid-sized company audits. And, you know, they have deadlines of March 31st and they'll probably get extended and, and some other things. But, you know, some of these small to mid-sized companies are going to, there's a thing called going concern and the auditors have to issue going concern opinions, meaning is this company going to be in business 12 months from now? Um, I think that's going to become a huge issue with these small businesses, um, particularly even in the tech world and some of the others. I, I just think that's going to be um, something that's major in the audit world that's caused by this epidemic or pandemic. Yeah. Will this also then be an opportunity for businesses to write off some things that they've been wanting to write off for a while as well? Yeah. I think most businesses try to write off that at least ones I'm involved with try to write off all that stuff anyway. I'd rather write it off sooner than later, but yeah, um, yeah probably give someone an opportunity to do it. Clean up a balance sheet if it's got some mess on it. Yeah, well, their figures might be down. Uh, I don't think they're going to want to write stuff off. I bet they already did, but I agree with Lou that they're going to want to clean up their financials so that they can apply for an SBA loan because there's a crisis loan out there, or like I said, show their stakeholders, their investors, their shareholders, a, a horrible, it's going to be an ugly report to shareholders without a doubt, but that they're going to want to say, it's going to be all right. It is an ongoing concern or we're going to see some companies wind down. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, and I, I should clarify my statement too. Not um, not that they've wanted to write off, but that they were aware of and haven't written off yet for various reasons. But you uh, know, I just want to jump in. I live there. This is where I live. And when there's a downtime, that's the time you plan your strategy. That is the time that you sow the seeds for what's going to happen a year from now. Mm -hmm. And I understand the CFOs are in firefighting mode. And the companies are in firefighting mode, but this is the time you step back and say, wait a second, I'm going to come out of this. You know, I'm a marketing guy. So everyone tells me the same thing. We'll do marketing later. D dangerous words, by the way. Now's the time you sow the seeds for the turnaround. You keep selling, you, you double down on the marketing line. I'm with you, Bill. If you See, have, my only friend. If you have the money. Yeah, you transform. That's what you're talking about. This is the time to transform. You know, I, I do want to bring up one other point, and I know I'm talking out of turn, but I know we have HR people on. Uh, if anyone's ever looked for a job, it's just a horrendous experience. It's awful. You know, I'm glad Lou is doing what he can with Lou's list because it really helps. But what I never understood is why companies don't make a friend of someone that they can't hire immediately why they don't sit there and say, okay, this person's out and about. Take, take Lou as, as an example. I would probably never hire him, but I sure want to make a friend of him. He knows a lot of people. He's in touch with what's going on in the community. And if I can get past that hire or not hire mode, I'm, I'm building this virtual sales force for what happens next. I think that's a, that's a great point. Um, and so what you're saying is you're saying lay down the foundation for your know, progression in the future. Absolutely. This is the time. So, um, so you, you all have brought up some really good points. I do want to run something by Lori very quickly. Uh, uh, Jen, you made a comment that um, made me think about you know, the how people are feeling as they're going through this experience, how employees might be feeling about going through this experience, and what that might end up, um, impact that might end up having on the disability policies. So for example, um, if uh, some employees end up feeling a form of, or experiencing, for example, a form of PTSD or um, some other form of disability as a, as a result of this experience, what type of implications that might have um, on some employment uh, or some employers' disability insurance programs, if that might even be a concern. I mean, yeah. it can, it could be a concern. It could, you know, um, I think that's something that will play out further down the road. Because it, it takes a lot for people to 
to figure that out that's what's going on with them and to go to the doctor and to get the diagnosis. And in order to qualify disability, you have to have all those things. Mm-hmm. You just can't say this is a problem and I get disability. You have to qualify for it. So uh, go ahead. There, there, I agree with you. I, I, I of course, uh, was thinking push pause on that. But I know here in California, they've completely stopped the waiting time for disability. Um, not completely, but it's not going to be hard to get, especially if, have, if you are sick with COVID-19. So on the, on the insurance side and on the EAP side, Lori, I, I, I went straight to when she said PTSD, having an executive assistance program next year might be an important benefit to have. Mm-hmm. Um, I haven't thought about that yet, but um, I think that the state plan is going to be to augment disability so that employers aren't necessarily paying for it. I, I mean, the government is, is just throwing money at the problem right now, theoretically. Okay. Now, EAP is really a really good idea because that's um, a helpful service that can help people get counseling that they need and potentially ward off the need for disability if it's separate from, I'm, I'm not talking about people who are actually sick with COVID-19, I'm just talking about people reacting to the situation. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and maybe bringing up from a previous experience they have, and then and then they they're back down that road of of PTSD, but um, but it, that takes a long time. But having an employee employee assistance program, which we mean by EAP, where people have access to counselors twenty four hours a day, seven days a week, and their family too can access it, I think is a very important benefit to provide employees. So that might be another thing that companies can do and use right now even to help employees that are in the situation is just remind them about the EAP that they have. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So we have eight minutes left. Um, Just want to see, is there anything else that any of you might like to cover tonight? I have one comment I just got on email, which I think kind of depicts what people are going through I'll share and then I have one additional tip um, that this guy said um, and I quote he said starting a new job is hard enough working remotely with two kids and a wife from home is just crazy mm. um, and I think that's what some people are starting to go through particularly if they haven't worked remotely and this is a, a CFO of a company here in town um, And then my other tip that I have for folks is now's a good time to negotiate. Um, Negotiate with your landlord, negotiate with uh, customers and or vendors. Um, And I think they're all going to be in a position because they don't have a lot of business. And if they're going to try to keep business, um, now's a good time to go negotiate. So if you're trying to control cash or trying to do some of these things, I'd go negotiate with your vendors. Um, maybe doesn't, isn't quite the nice thing to say about or right thing to do to go squeeze somebody, but you know, you got to kind of do what you need to do to keep your business afloat and to do the best thing for your business. So now might be the time to go negotiate some of those things. Mm. And that's a very good point. We did receive a question earlier uh, during the call on payables, how do you manage your payables? I haven't addressed that um, just because I was saving it in case we had time, but we also plan to address that in tomorrow's call. Um, So I encourage the person to join that call as well and and hear what the response is, but that at least gives us an opportunity to touch on that a little bit to mention that one way that you can do that is by negotiating um, with your vendors. How about you, John? I'm, I'm looking at this both sides, not just the vendors, but the clients. I agree you negotiate. I'm encouraging clients to call their clients and check in with them. It might be time to negotiate by giving them a break on their credit card fee. That's, that's an option. Um, to make them understand that you're willing to work with them because you want those customers to be your customers a year from now. And we're all in this together. You need to help your client get through this. So I'm, I, I have this tremendous torn feeling. I have to get cash because we can't work for free. I also have to help our clients who I love and adore and help them with payment plans or something. So that's one negotiation on the top end. Or maybe a client 
it says, I, I'm going to, I'm going to cancel this project. You negotiate with them. So they'll just defer it. You, this is the time to really be creative on the expense side. Of course, I'm clearly doing a lot of uh, layoffs. If it's a long-term problem for a company that's a hospitality company or driven by trade show attendance and the trade show isn't going to happen now till next year, those of my clients were laying off. Others were furloughing We're controlling costs on the payable side. We are definitely slowing things down. If you, if you are a company with a bunch of offices and a bunch of rents and your grace period is five days on your rent, we are advising people to take the five day grace period. Every day that you have cash in your hand is another day that you live to fight. And there's nothing more important right now. And then the last vendor to negotiate with or at least call and network with is your bank. So I think banks are a huge place to start. I would love to see my clients negotiate with landlords, but until you have leverage and you see someone else move out, it, maybe you want to hold your fire on that. Okay. All right, and we also received a question in regards to uh, m and due diligence. We're actually, the question that was asked, we're specifically planning to address that tomorrow as well. So um, the person from Jen's company, uh, John Kogan, will also be joining us and he'll be speaking specifically on that tomorrow. All right, um, Lori, how about you? All right, any last thoughts? Um, I would just say try to, to stay calm and to really just focus on what your job is and try to do the, your job if you have it to the best of your ability and try to think of new and different ways to innovate it and make it so it can you can get through this i'd also say try to stay connected with people don't allow yourself to get isolated reach out to people reach out to your friends reach out to your coworkers. reach out to your managers and just check in as often as you can to, to keep the connection going. So do remember that everyone's human. Yeah. And that, yeah. It's part of the responsibility of being a manager and being leaders, you know, helping the people that are reporting up into you. Yes, okay. absolutely. Thank you. And uh, Bill, how about you? So, <laughs> Do you see what I have done? You're all going to remember this. Now, if I was doing this for pure comedy, I'd wear a toupee. But what I just did was I proactively differentiated myself. And all of you are talking about a reactive situation. We are too. I am too. But the idea of proactively differentiating, those are going to be the winners and the losers in the next couple of years. Everyone seems to sell the same thing the same way in the same industry all the time. The ones who differentiate are going to be the winners. And that's what I would be doing in inclusion with those negotiations and trying to get your expenses cut and trying to get better terms. And some of those, um, some of the ways or opportunities to differentiate, as you mentioned, for example, with the restaurant person might not require a lot of cash up front. It might not even require any cash up front to do it. Right. There's, there's product, there's place, there's service. There's price, there's how you promote. So, I mean, this, this silly thing that I'm showing you, imagine the first person who starts getting these things really decorated and cool and puts Denver Broncos logos on them. There's a differentiator there. I mean, it sounds silly, but I lived in Asia for many years and they have different colored things like this with logos on them. Okay. All right, well, thank you. I'd like uh, want to thank again all of our speakers for participating in this. Uh, if there are any follow-up questions, um, you, please don't hesitate to send them to info at taxboard.org, and uh, we will share them with our speakers and see if we can collect additional information. Again, we'll have another presentation tomorrow. It's at 1 o'clock Pacific time, 3 o'clock, if I have the times right, Eastern time. Um, it'll be a full hour webinar and we'll have two more scheduled for next week, um, early next week. So again, Bill, Jen, Lou, and Lori, thank you again for participating in this and thank you to everyone for your questions today. Have a good day. Thanks, Ashby. So long. Yeah.